Linebacker questions, all-time free agents, and Mike Florio's stake. It's Twitter Tuesday here on the Locked On Vikings podcast. You are Locked On Vikings, your daily Minnesota Vikings podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's going on, everybody? Welcome, welcome, welcome to another episode of the Locked On Vikings podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. As always, I am your host, your pal, and the kid you copied off in math class. My name is Luke Braun. You can find me on Twitter at Luke Braun NFL. You can find the show on Twitter at Locked On Vikings. Today on the show, it is Twitter Tuesday. So thank you so much for making Locked On Vikings your first listen of the day. If you have any Twitter Tuesday questions, you can always shoot them to me at Luke Braun NFL or at Locked On Vikings on Twitter. You can send an email to Locked On Vikings Podcast at gmail.com. You can fill out the Google form, which is in the show notes, or you can leave a YouTube comment if you're watching on YouTube. I can see those as well. Sometimes I'll just answer those on the spot, but I'll save some of them for Twitter Tuesday uh, if I want to. So let's go into today's mailbag. It's a nice full one. Let's get right into it. The first one comes from Alan McCauley, who asks, What's your favorite? What was your favorite tough Borland moment? Uh, Alan McCauley gets at the only real news of the day, which is that tough Borland was released from the 90 man roster. He will be replaced by a trial player by the name of William Quenku. Uh, he is a rookie trial guy. I love when trial guys make the roster um, because they have already upset the status quo once. I ca- they're like weirdly more of a wild card than like an undrafted guy will be. Well, you know, like an undrafted rookie, a lot of times those guys are just there to be camp bodies or you have guys that were practice squatters last year that are just sort of warm bodies. They're never going to make the team. But a tryout player, rookie tryout player who went to rookie minicamp without a spot on the 90-man roster and then earned one has sort of broken the the tide a little bit, broken the the momentum, the inertia of that like preseason roster process. Teams did not put William Quenku on their 90-man rosters. He has now proven that they were wrong to do that. And now it's like, well, how wrong were they? We kind of don't know this. I mean, Chad Beebe made the team for a couple years this way. Adam Thielen is the famous one. Like, this happens. And it's very fun. Um, I don't have a lot of analysis on the guy. But, uh, I mean, I don't know. Trial players are always kind of a name to watch. As for my favorite Tough Borland moment is probably when he took over for Chad Surratt in two games in 2021, which I think is hilarious not because I like wish ill on Chad Surratt or anything like that. Like, I don't think it was a good pick, but that's as far as it goes more because there's that like stupid narrative about how Mike Zimmer hates rookies and people will like point to any, the Kellen Mond and Wyatt Davis and all that stuff, which like that's a more fair point than Chad Surratt who was benched for a different rookie and lost his special teams job to a different rookie. Like, Oh, that dude just sucks then. (laughs) And it's like tough Borland famously bad from the championship game and stuff. Um, clearly should not have been on a roster, but he was out of desperation. Uh, that's my favorite tough Borland moment. Um, and I'm pretty sure he got, he either got rocked or rocked someone on a punt return in the Steelers game. That was pretty fun too. Uh, Ed Donatello asked, what can you tell us about tough Borland replacement? William Quenku. I I can't really tell you much. Um, but also Demetrius Washington, if you have time. So Demetrius Washington is the other news was signed on as VP of football operations, which is a fairly big job. Um, that's, probably, I don't know if it's the same title, but it's probably a similar responsibility to like what George Payton had. So this is a pretty big dude. This is going to be the guy that gets poached to be a GM candidate someday. But he sounds kind of like he's just like a friend of Quasi's from the R&D department in San Francisco. Um, and it sounds like he probably will do a lot of those same roles. Maybe be Quasi's Quasi, if that makes sense. Um, kind of be that, that right-hand man, but also that kind of like head quant sort of thing. That would be my guess, um, but it's a high-ranking job. This is actually probably going to have a pretty big impact on the organization. It's just that we won't ever really get to know from the outside what impact that is, who who he was pushing for, who he wasn't pushing for, when he got overruled or when he didn't. We never really get to know that. Alexander the Dane asks, who will be the vocal leader on defense in 2022? That's got to be Zadarius Smith, right? I mean, like, on defense? Like, yeah, he's absolutely the guy. I think they were really missing that without Everson Griffin or with a more subdued Everson Griffin in the last couple of years. Um, yeah, Zedaria Smith, I, like, his energy and that he brings that to the Vikings is actually kind of one of the reasons that I'm excited about him, um, you know, in addition to everything he actually does on the field. Shoot That S asks, based on your analysis of tape, do you think Chaz Surratt replaces Jordan Hicks or Eric Kendricks first? I'll hang up and listen. 
Um, okay, taking that question as seriously as I can, would he replace Jordan Hicks or Eric Kendricks? Probably Eric Kendricks. Jordan Hicks is playing what I would imagine like an Anthony Barr-esque role would be, where it's a little there's more physicality to it. There might be some edge setting to it, kind of like a strong side linebacker taking on blocks and stuff. But also, you know, still an off-ball linebacker and coverage and run fits and all that stuff. But perhaps it's a more physical role than what Eric Kendricks does, which is more coverage focused. And then Chaz Surratt would be like the next level. And I think formally he's in a competition with Asamoa and Troy Dye and like all these different guys that like for that more coverage focused kind of nickel package three, three, five new linebacker that will rotate in only in like very particular situations. Um, I'm sure they will have a three, three, five nickel package that comes out, even if it's not their normal one, like that comes out and then he'll compete for like that role. And I just don't really see him winning it. So I don't think he would actually like, if he were good, he wouldn't replace either of those guys. He would win the, the rotational role. Nolan asks, can you help me understand why the Vikings keep drafting undersized linebackers? There's a lot of linebacker questions today. Does it have something to do with how the position has evolved across the league? Um, short answer, yes. I've always been a big fan of Barr and how he can affect offensive game plans. And so I get a little disappointed every time we draft a 220 pound linebacker. So the thing about Barr is that he could do everything a 220 pound linebacker could do at 250 pounds. Like that's what made him insane was that he could play like Brian Asamoah played at Oklahoma, which, uh, by the way, hopefully at some point this week I will get to a breakdown of him. But, like, that coverage linebacker, that think of it like an Eric Wilson kind of style of being able to go from one side of the field to the other, um, but also could be, like, a run game savant in the way that Eric Wilson never could be. Um, and that was what made Anthony Barr so special in his prime. Um, why they keep drafting 220 pound guys well it's because the physical side of that role has just grown to be less important over the last few years as uh run games have gotten smaller like physically smaller people there's a lot more garrett bradbury's in the league than you would think and that has meant that the guys on the other side don't have to be as big and at the same time a lot of speedy burners coming out of the league a lot of super tracksters um, you know, the million wide receivers that have come into the league. Think about the 2020 draft class with Jefferson in it and and C.D. Lamb and T. Higgins and like all these guys. And even last year, you know, Jamar Chase. And like there's so many young receivers that can stretch a defense. Everybody needs to have a little more range nowadays. Um, and they don't necessarily need to have as much physicality. So the Chaz Surratt style of linebacker is, I think, a good thing. Surratt himself is too unphysical. Like his physicality is just a scotch too bad. But that's where you get guys like Troy Dye and Asamoah and all those guys that I think are a more responsible version of that same mold. And Chad Surratt's just a little too min-maxed. Um, that's kind of always been my problem with him. I have a whole bunch more questions to get to, but let's talk real quick about Built Bar. Built Bar is a delicious protein bar covered in 100% chocolate. And now they have a new birthday cake puffs flavor. You heard that right for a protein bar. This is like something with enough protein in it. You could have it after a workout and it would like do what it's supposed to do. But it's marshmallowy and it tastes like birthday cake. It's absolutely degenerate. I love those things. They're also great for like a midnight snack that you don't have to feel too bad about. Whatever you get though at Built Bar, go to Built.com, enter promo code LOCKED15. You can get 15% off of your order. That's promo code LOCKED15 at Built.com. Thanks so much for making Lockdown Vikings your first listen of the day. Let's move on with this Twitter Tuesday mailbag. The next one comes from Skull Actuary, who asks, with Jair and Rogers extensions, are the Packers still going to be as dominant in two or three years? Are there any repercussions to them pushing the cap out or just no? So I've always been of the mind that the cap repercussions, I think, are overrated. Nobody says that, the, well, some people are like, the cap just literally doesn't exist. And obviously that's not true, but it's, it's very, it's a lot easier to borrow money then people make it seem you can extend things out. And I don't think the punish for extending cap out really is there until eventually you have a year where you have to start paying things off and make t making tough decisions. And I think teams can put that year off like really, really far. If I were a GM, I would put that off as far as I possibly could. And then basically hope that whenever my time there is done, it's the next guy that has to deal with it. Um, and that's kind of what the Packers are doing. Like with the Aaron Jones contract, they got two void years on, on the end of that contract that essentially have no money on them right now. If, if they cut or if, if Aaron Jones's contract voided, they would owe less than $2 million. And they can probably afford to put money into that category to help give them some cap, cap relief soon. 
and the Jair Alexander. I, I mean, I think he's absolutely worth the money for them. He's phenomenal. And Aaron Rodgers will be there for as long as Aaron Rodgers will be there. My, my Packers analysis is pretty simple. They're going to be elite for as long as Aaron Rodgers is their quarterback. They will own the division for as long as Aaron Rodgers is their quarterback or until somebody else gets a quarterback as good as Aaron Rodgers, but that ain't the case right now. Um, and that's kind of it. And everything else is window dressing. Um, but eventually their cap will come back to bite them. But if that's post Aaron Rodgers, I don't think anybody in Green Bay cares that they know they'll be in a rebuild there. And that'll, that's a great time to like get the books balanced, kind of what the Bears are doing now, except the Bears are kind of going in the wrong direction with that. But that's a, another conversation. Nathan Holtz asks, in his intro press conference, O'Connell mentioned Barr's name as someone he was excited to coach. Now that the Vikings are pretty clearly not bringing Barr back, I feel like that means one of two things. Either he said Barr meant someone, said Barr and meant someone else, or he just said Barr's name since he had two picks against the Rams last year and didn't think about his contract. Um, the second one like, could be, like he literally like just got there. But for the interview, you have to familiarize yourself with the team. So I'm sure he was plenty familiar with Barr's and, and his situation and stuff. But I think Anthony Barr has that knee tendonitis issue. I don't know if he got surgery or anything on it or, or what his future is. Barr might not play. <laughs> So it could have been a thing where, hey, we'd be super interested in bringing you back. And, you know, considering how you played last year, we still think you can. And Barr saying, I'm in an immense amount of pain. No, that could that's just as likely as the Vikings saying, eh, maybe not. And I don't think it's unlikely that guys just like change their mind. He comes in, he gets a better sense for what he's doing. He hires coaches and then, you know, hires linebackers, coaches and, and, and Donatel and all these guys. And they go, eh, we're going to go a different direction. Let's get Jordan Hicks instead. But I think once they signed Jordan Hicks, that kind of was to me, OK, now they're done with Barr. Mm -hmm. But Barr might be done with the sport entirely. Um, DC94 asks, on reflection, who did you prefer after their draft, Wyatt or Ingram, ignoring off-field? Um, okay, so ignoring off-field, I think I actually put them in the same tier. I think I came to the conclusion that I would put Ed Ingram in the bottom of the second round, which is where he went. Um, and I kind of came to the conclusion, okay, I agree with that. Um, and I had Wyatt Davis, I believe, in the middle of the second round. So I think it was Wyatt Davis. I'd have to go look at my stuff, but I loved Wyatt Davis coming out. I was a huge Wyatt. He was like one of hashtag my guys. So I was really excited when they took him. Um, and when he didn't play or anything like that, you know, yeah, it sent me reeling for looking for answers and all that, um, which I think I found. But I, I think I liked Davis better than Ingram by call it, I don't know, a third of a round. Yannick Eckhart asks, I think he'll be the center in 2022, but who on the Vikings roster is most likely to replace Garrett Bradbury? That's an interesting question because I think the huge overwhelming favorite would be someone not on the roster. But you said who on the roster. So of the people I have available to me, Schlotman possibly. Um, he's somebody that Kevin O'Connell kind of personally brought from the Rams, right? He was like one of the first people that came over from the Rams. So, you know, he's one of, one of O'Connell's faves. So that could happen. Um, I don't know if he's a particularly good player, though, so I don't know if he can win that job, but he certainly has the favor. Um, somebody like Chris Reed could be it. Somebody like Wyatt Davis could move and like learn snapping, and maybe that's a path for him. So somebody like that, but I don't know. I guess Schlotman, but like none of these guys are likely. It's very likely going to be somebody not on the roster, if not an extension of Garrett Bradbury and Kevin O'Connell's right and switching to what they're switching to, making the changes to the zone scheme that they're making saves him and everything. Maybe he's right and that happens. Barring that, probably somebody not on the roster. Um, I have a bunch more questions that I want to get to, so I'll try to zip through them real fast. But first, let me talk to you about your car. It's rainy season. That means you got to be safe about your car, all right? Especially if you, like, spin out or something like that. If you don't live in a place where you'll have, like, snow tires, um, it's really easy to hydroplane spin out. And you don't want to be in a situation like that and not have the right materials with you. Flashlight and, um, like, jumper cables if your car goes, if your battery goes down, or a tire kit if you blow your tire or something like that. You want to have those safety supplies with you. Find that stuff at rockauto.com and you'll find that stuff a lot cheaper than you'll find it at like a brick and mortar auto shop, which is going to upcharge you. Rock Auto doesn't do any of that kind of stuff. They're looking out for you. They're a family company. They've been doing this for 15 years. So go to rockauto.com, whatever it is that you buy there, just let them know that Locked On sent you because if you don't, the rabbits will start an underground fight club and I'm never going to be able to know about it. Rock Auto, amazing selection, reliably low prices, all the parts your car will ever need. Moving on with this Twitter Tuesday episode, the next question comes from Mitchell Dykstra, who said, which rookie and or second year player are you hoping will surpass your expectations the most? I think I'm slamming Kellen Mond on this, right? The, the most valuable thing that could happen with a second year player or a rookie is Kellen Mond being good. And then some, oh my God, we have a quarterback on a rookie contract, right? Like what if he just totally unlocks and he just needed a year? That is, I don't expect that. So if he surpasses my expectations in that way, I think that's the 
best outcome by a pretty big mile, right? Uh, Ryan Spry asks, do you think Kirk will struggle in a pass-happy McVay system? A lot of people assume hiring an offensive head coach will help, but they forget that Kirk was, is at his best when the run game drives the offense. Okay, so I think what you're driving at is not volume of passing, because more passes will make a quarterback look better. They'll get more stats, and people will just never be able to see past that. But um, I think you're talking about play action. And if O'Connell runs less play action, yes, I do think that would be worse for Kirk Cousins, and it would be a strange fit. And... What O'Connell thinks of play action is a bit of an arguable thing based on what he said in the past. When he was at Washington, he wanted to be more of a short passes to set up longer passes kind of th- kind of guy. Um, this will alarm you, very similar to John Filippo, but there are other coaches in the league that have been more successful with that kind of strategy. Um, but kind of using passes at the... The big meme is an extension of the run game, but using shorter passes to manipulate players in the same way that the run game does, because really all you're trying to do is get a guy to want to go left so that you can hit him to the right. Um, Whether that's with a run play or a quick pass or a whatever, I I think is all just a matter of preference. And in Washington, O'Connell wanted to use more short passes instead of running plays, but he also spent the last two years with Sean McVay, the most famous play action user ever. So I don't know what comes out of of that crockpot, but I do think more play action is better for Kirk Cousins. It's one of his best skills and attributes, rolling out to his left. That's his superpower. Taking that away, I don't think would be best for him. Um, but I don't think o- O'Connell is going to like ignore that fact. Um, Kurt with two C's asks, how are we feeling about an ISM breakout season? Sure. Yeah, I'm in. Eric the Red asks, why has the QB market exploded over the last few years? It was only four years ago that Kirk set the market with his $28 million a year deal. Now the going rate for elite quarterbacks is closer to 50 mil. How has that number nearly doubled in only four years? I get cap increases slash inflation, but still. So I think two things here. A, cap increase has a lot to do with it. That explains like 75% of this growth is just cap inflation, if you just adjust for that. But I do believe even if you do a percentage of the cap, QB contracts are bigger. And I think part of that, too, is if you go by average per year, I think teams have gotten a little bit more aggressive about kicking can down the road and promising more money and with the understanding that they can always restructure those deals later and, and kind of make money out of thin air. I think the Saints really blazed that trail and the Eagles blazed that trail. And now teams like the Vikings and Packers are doing it a lot more. Um, and the, the Vikings have always been on that too, but um, a lot of teams are now doing that a little bit more so they can kind of realize, wow, I can really afford to. And the other thing is there's been a huge influx in quarterbacks from like 2017, 2018 draft classes that all got their contracts. And that kind of reset the market. You know, you had all the, the, the Watsons and the, the Mahomes and then Josh Allen and Lamar Jackson on the other side, like all these guys, needed contracts and some of them are still waiting for contracts um like we'll see what baker mayfield makes whatever happens to him right he's an interesting case for a contract for like what amount that should be um but that it's just this huge glut of contracts all hit the market and that's going to have an inflating effect charlie g asks do you think kevin o'connell will handle it better or worse than zim when we inevitably lose a big game on a missed kick look man there's nothing right to say ask yourself what you want a coach to say in that situation. You want to say something like, look, you know, we, we didn't do that right. We're going to go back and we're going to, you know, see what we did wrong. We're going to learn from our mistakes. Sounds quite a lot like the Leslie Frazier will look at the tape thing, right? That everybody hated him for saying. Uh, Zimmer was brutally honest about stuff. He would not do those platitudes. He would say, no, we did this wrong. We did that wrong. We did that wrong. And we need to go fix it. And I always appreciated that. But when you're losing, it just sounds like he's blaming people rather than taking, you know, having the, you know, talking just candidly to the media and, and actually answering questions. When you're losing, everything sounds bad. When, you, when you're a good team and you lose one, you say, well, go back at the table, look at our mistakes. You go, ah, yeah, there's a guy that's self-aware. And when you're losing, you go, ah, there's a guy that doesn't want to answer the question. There's no right thing. Everybody will hate it, and it all just depends on the record. Uh, Rorschach Cousins asks, Eric Eager claimed that Antoine Winfield was the best free agent signing in Vikings history. Agree, or do you have an option you think was better? Um, so we talked a little bit about this, about what counts as a free agent. Um, and I decided I would not count undrafted rookies like John Randall because that's basic. I mean, that's a rookie, right? But I will count somebody like Chris Carter, a waiver claim who is a free agent signing functionally just via the waivers process instead of unrestricted free agency. Um, and to me, that's just a different kind of free agency. And the real thing is Chris Carter was on another team and then they decided they did not want Chris Carter on their team anymore and the Vikings did. I think that's what a free agent has to be. So obviously the answer is Chris Carter. A few other honorable mentions. I think Winfield's certainly up there. Pat Williams goes in there for me. John Gilliam, if you want to go way back. 
Um, some really cool wide receivers that have been good free agency signings. I mean, pick your favorite 90s quarterback, but I think I have to go with Chris Carter. Oh, Steve Hutchinson's another really good one. There have been some good ones over the years. Caleb asks, likelihood we add another semi-big free agent this year, OBJ, et cetera. A lot of people asked a question, what about James Bradbury, which I actually talked about in an episode last week. Uh, what about you know this guy or that guy? Probably low. I do think they have the cap for it, but that cap might just roll over and help out with next year. Um, but they could... But, like, there are some groups that I think are just, like, super done. I think they could add an edge rusher. That's what I would do. But I think the wide receiver group is pretty much filled out. Like, I already felt like I was, when I did my roster prediction, I felt like I was cut, forced to cut a rosterable player there. So that usually tells me the group's done. Um, the same went with cornerback. I felt like I was cutting a player that could be on a 53, and um, that means the group's done. So I don't think that they would go for, like, a James Bradbury, personally. Um, I think you could always go get... Another edge rusher, though, like get, give me a, a Jadeveon Clowney. Um, they could bring back Sheldon Richardson. That's something he plays. I think a very particular role that the Vikings could use, and those are the kind of guys that just sign on like a random Tuesday in June. So uh, something to keep an eye out. But I think only a few groups need it. Uh, Ryder Jensen asks, watching the draft room videos reminded me of working for a large company that does a Gallup poll every three years and comes up with a feel-good slogan like Dream Chasers that really changes nothing. Still a violent game played by A-type personalities. Can a bunch of hippies win? So I share this critique generally about the corporatization of the Vikings. Like literally when you turn into TCO Performance Center, there's a sign out front that says a corporate environment, which the Wilfs put on there because I think they plan to have other business and have it be like a, a plaza of office spaces and stuff. But like, come on, man. Like the Vikings are so stale and corporate. And like Kirk Cousins is the most corporate. He calls himself a CEO. It's all very good, PR friendly. Um, and I mean, Quasi's a Wall Street guy. Of course he's into the corporate buzzword shenanigan nonsense. Dude's a commodities trader. That's like how they talk. So I totally share this. I think it they, the the Vikings for a long time have been, I mean, for decades, this is well beyond, quasi beyond, honestly beyond the Wilfs. Um, they have been missing that sort of heart that that they had back in the, the, the 70s and 80s when they were, I think, a scrappier unit. I don't think they've had that since they moved inside, since they built the Metrodome. Uh, Johnny L., Asked a couple that I liked. Use your crystal ball. The first one is use your crystal ball to use, look a few years in the future. A retired Kirk Cousins starts a non-football podcast. What is the topic? Is it any good? So first question is very easy. The topic is about faith. A hundred percent. Kirk Cousins is a pastor's son through and through to the core. His faith is everything to him. And he would have endless things to say about it. He totally would do a faith podcast. Is it any good? I think if you would be in the audience for a faith-based podcast, yeah, Kirk Cousins is a very is a, an eloquent speaker. I think he's got a he's got a good podcast voice. I think he'd be a, a good podcaster if he wanted to do a faith-based podcast. Although he'd be stepping on Paul Allen's toes a little bit, so you know you'd have to work that out. Uh, the second question from Johnny L is: Imagine a Twilight Zone scenario where you could go back in time to April twenty seventh, and the only change you can make is to trade every single twenty twenty two draft pick for its twenty twenty three equivalent. Uh, do you keep current picks or do you build the draft slash trade capital for 2023? Oh, okay. I did not like the 2022 class. So if I'm making this decision, I actually think I take that deal because a, every pick moves up around. And I think that's a market inefficiency. Like that's what it costs. But I think the team that moves the pick up around wins more often than not. And also you would then have two higher First, you have two first rounders that would be able to get you, you know, your CJ Stroud or your Bryce Young. That would be you could go way up to the top. You'd have so much capital. I think I take that deal. I think I slam that deal, to be honest. Um, that would be pretty sick and like way better for the long term. Um, you'd be a little bit strapped for depth in 2022, but I think that would be worth it. Uh, just a friend asks. Wouldn't it be fun if during Pro Bowl week, every NFL practice squad had to put a roster together for a series of seven on seven games? Yeah. So with Pro Bowl expansion stuff, the thing that usually people don't like is if you if you pitch a Pro Bowl thing that is a contact sport that somebody could get injured in, nobody will ever do it because it's all just exhibition and for fun. So you either have to put stakes on it, like what the MLB All-Star Game does, where it's like, you know, winner of the All-Star Game gets home field for the best of seven or whatever. You do something like that, or you have to make it so it's non-contact, which seven on seven is non-contact, so I would be into it, but I would also weep for guys in the trenches that don't get to go to the Pro Bowl on their, on their practice squad. Um, but I, I don't think there's a reason not to do it, right? 
Um, you know, send those practice squad guys there too and have them do like, I don't know, that strongman competition. Joe Cool asks, how do you like your steak cooked? Florio style or hockey puck? <laughs> so for context, uh, Mike Florio of Pro Football Talk very frequently pu- uh, publishes on Twitter pictures of meats that he has very, very poorly mistreated. Um, and this time he did a steak that looked like it was like tuna seared. Like it had a very, very hard line sear, um, which you get at a very high temperature. So it looks like he just blasted this thing at way too high of a temperature. And the steak was probably still cold. He probably had it in the fridge and just slapped it right on the grill without letting it come to room temperature, which if you don't know how to grill, uh, you have to take, let your steaks come up to room temp. Otherwise the difference between the interior temperature and the exterior temperature will be too great and you get a very hard line instead of this nice gradient of color um which the hard line looks kind of pretty but it won't eat as well it'll be a like tough and chewy and he said it was a wagyu steak which is very very fatty cut that's what makes wagyu so expensive is that it's very flavorful and and fatty but that has to be under heat for some certain amount of time so all that fat can render otherwise that is just chewy fat and wagyu is like not meant to be eaten that rare so Florio, buddy, get it together. Like, Google these things. I, I don't even have a grill and I know this stuff. So um, that said, I probably would still eat that over like a hockey puck well-done steak. Though I have messed up plenty of steaks in my time. Like, let he who is without sin cast the first hockey puck. But what I will do, what I've done when I've ruined a steak, like I was, oh my God, I overcooked that thing so bad and it's like, you know, medium well or well done. I'll, t- I'll rip it and it is now brisket. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll just like toss it in some sauce or something and put it on a sandwich. And I, that's a better, but I mean, there's a lot of like, if you've messed up a steak, this is what a, like a one steak sauce is for is to rescue a steak that you totally mistreated. If you, if you cook a steak properly, that needs butter and nothing else. Or there are some fancy sauces if you want to go there, but that's it. Uh, squeaks asks cat or dog. Always been a dog person, but nothing wrong with cats to me, but you know, obviously, uh, I prefer rabbits. Chris asks, what company do you think would be the funniest to hear Kirk read ad copy on for his podcast? Uh, That is a very good question. It would be really funny to hear Kirk do a Manscaped ad read because he's just so goofy and awkward. We'll go with Manscaped. Uh, With that, thank you all so much for listening to this Twitter Tuesday mailbag episode. I will talk to you tomorrow. Maybe we'll do some Azamoa stuff. Maybe we'll do some history stuff. I don't know. We'll let the, the day take me. We'll see. But uh, whatever it is, I hope you tune in. I will see you all tomorrow. And as always, let's go.